Welcome to module 1.2. In this module we're going to look at the characteristics of life and in particular we're going to try to get a sense for how it is that those individuals who actually have to know what life is would define it. Now this is different than what you might find in a textbook. In fact it uh, is going to be different than what I learned as an undergraduate as well. And the reason that I'm doing it this way though is because it seems to me much more authentic to get information from people who have to know what this definition is. Here's the hard part. It doesn't seem hard, but it is. What is life? Now, life is one of those things where you can sort of point to it and say, okay, that thing is alive and that thing is not. But when you get down to what are the characteristics of something that's alive and what are the characteristics of something that is not alive, it becomes much, much more difficult to figure this out. Now, the people who, for whom this is a practical problem are the people who are trying to determine if there's life on other planets. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to start looking at uh, those situations where people are trying to find out if there's life on other planets. Here is another planet. This picture right here is Gale Crater, Crater and uh, this is on Mars. So it may look like somewhere out here in Arizona, but you notice there's absolutely nothing alive. And this is indeed the Martian uh, surface of, uh, of, of that planet. The question that we have is, is there life on there? So you might wonder, who cares? Who cares if there's life on there? Well, I for one care, and many, many other people care. The reason that we care is think about this. Throughout history, throughout human history, people have assumed that the Earth was made for human beings. And even to the point where we had a belief that the Earth is the center of the universe and everything else is sort of there for our purpose. Imagine, though, if we find life on another planet, what does that do to religion? What does that do to our understanding of our place in the universe? That's why it's important to people. That's why we want to find out. So let's take a look at this. This is a serious study. It's a serious undertaking trying to figure these things out. So here you've already, if you've done the learning module, which you should have by this time, have gone to the Mars Exploration Program mission statement and you've read it and you know then that the goal of the program is to study Mars and they've sent a number of spacecraft. Here are some of the ones that they sent in the past and you've presumably looked these up on the website. Here are current missions that are currently operating uh, either in orbit around Mars or on the surface. And then here are future missions. This uh, Mars 2020 is actually going to launch here before too long. So you've seen that and you've also taken a look at this page right here and you've read through the through uh, the goal, the first goal of the Mars Exploration Program, which I will ask you about on the quiz. So I'm not going to go through it here, but you've read it. So knowing that there are people who are on mission in NASA trying to find out if there are living creatures on the surface of Mars, they've got to know what they're looking for. So what are they looking for? Well, You've probably heard this term, organism. They're looking for organisms. An organism to a biologist, to now the technical definition, is any living creature, any living entity that is containing more than one cell, one or more cells, sorry, one or more cells. And that includes, for example, human beings. That includes this, for example, which you're looking at here is uh, liver tissue. And these are individual cells. There's a cell there. That purple is a nucleus, that purple is a nucleus, that purple is a nucleus, and so forth. So the point, though, is that right now it appears that the things that we understand as being alive are things that are going to be made out of cells, because all the living things that we know of are made out of cells. So if we go to Mars, what do we expect to see? Well, do we expect to see something like this with these weird-looking plants and maybe a creature that looks like this? It's not that far-fetched, actually that one might consider this. Certainly this comes from a movie uh, that has been remade a number of times, and which was originally a, a book written by H.G. Wells. But these are things that are imagined by people and were imagined by people quite recently. In fact, this individual, his name is Percival Lowell. And he is somebody you may have heard of, especially if you've been to Flagstaff. He built an observatory in Flagstaff. In fact, here he is in his observatory in Flag. That's a a telescope that he had built, the Clark Telescope, uh, and he built himself this big huge dome uh, in which this telescope sits. Now this picture was taken around the turn of the 20th, 20th century and this at the time was one of the best telescopes uh, in existence and he was using it primarily to study the surface of Mars. 
Why was he studying Mars? Well, because he was interested in what he was seeing here. You can see in this picture these dark areas, long dark areas, small dark areas, and they seem to be connected, in his mind anyway, in his, his view, they seem to be connected by lines. Now, what were those lines? He was wondering what those lines were. Here's another picture of them. And he had read a study that was done by a number of individuals, a couple of individuals from Italy. And in Italy, of course, they were writing their scientific research in Italian. And they seemed to see similar straight lines on the surface of the planet. And they called them canelli, which sounds a lot like the English word canal, but would I understand to be translated into English more like channel. So what's the difference between a channel and a canal? Channels are generally naturally made. So we think of a river channel. We don't say a river canal that's natural. A canal is something that a person would make. Now Lowell, whether it was a mistake in his translation or not, I don't know, but he interpreted them as canal, not channel, which means he was interpreting these as some sort of thing that was manufactured by some creature that lived on Mars, obviously not human. Um, he didn't posit that. But then the question is, what are these? What, were, what was making these canals? Well, some creature. And these things that he saw, these dark areas, these dark patches that seem to be the nexes of these, of these long canals, he was interpreting as cities. And you see here on the pole, on the North Pole, and a little bit on the South Pole here of this uh, planet, he saw white, which he was interpreting then as, like Earth, water ice. So he's expecting that to be ice. So here's what he suggested. He said, there is a brilliant civilization on Mars. Why is there a civilization? Well, something had to build the canals. Why is it brilliant? This would be, obviously, if he's correct, a global engineering project that would have been successful. Now, could we, human beings, do this at the turn of the 20th century? Make a global project of canals that crisscross the entire globe? We've not done it yet. We haven't done anything even remotely like this. Yes, we have impacted the entire globe. I don't disagree with that statement, but we have not had one integrated engineering project across the entire globe, which this would represent. So therefore, they must be brilliant. In his mind, he concluded they must be more brilliant than we are. So why did they build the canals? What he suggested was that Mars once was much like Earth. It had rivers and lakes and streams and oceans, and something happened. An ecological disaster occurred. He didn't know what. He didn't posit anything that I know of anyway. And for whatever reason, that desertified. It caused the entire planet to become a desert, and all of the water ended up at the poles as ice. Now, the civilization had already existed before all of that disaster occurred. In fact, they may have caused the disaster. So to respond, what they then did, he posited, he suggests, is build canals that are connected to factories at the poles. And the factories use an enormous amount of energy to melt that water, and then they distribute the melted water throughout the entire planet in these canal systems. That, again, indicates that whatever could possibly do that must be extremely intelligent, far more intelligent than humans have shown themselves to be up to the point where he made this picture. So that all of that reasoning is not entirely flawed. It is partially flawed, and you should know that it is flawed. But what I want to do is to step back a little bit and talk a little bit about what exactly is going on here in Lowell's mind. Now, how do we know that Lowell was wrong? And you should know that we're aware that Lowell is wrong. How do we know that? It isn't just that somebody else comes up and says, I don't believe Lowell, I don't believe that, I just can't believe that, that there would be a civilization on Mars and so forth. We actually need what's called evidence. Evidence is not proof, not in the mind of a scientist. Proof in a sci to, to a scientist is something that is very, very different. Now, in legal uh, situations, proof and evidence are often interchanged. But to a scientist, evidence is information that comes directly from nature herself, not an opinion, not somebody's thought, not somebody's logic and saying, that is correct because it makes sense to me. That's exactly not evidence. That's opinion. That's very different. What we need is something that demonstrates from nature herself whether or not Lowell was right or wrong. 
Well, it's pretty obvious. All we got to do to find out is go to Mars. And now Lowell couldn't at the turn of the 20th century. They didn't have the spacecraft. It was already, it was going to be 50, 60 years before we were even going to have a spacecraft that could go to the moon. So there was nothing that was capable of actually doing anything more than Lowell was able to do with this big telescope until around the 1960s when we started sending probes to Mars. The first few probes, as you read, went out and just sort of uh, flew by Mars and a couple went into orbit. But now we've landed on Mars. If you look, each one of these points right here is a place where one of our landers has actually landed. So these yellow dots are places where our lander has landed. So not only that, but we've had two major orbiting spacecraft, Global, Mars Global Surveyor and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that have imaged the entire surface of the planet, every single piece of the planet, to one or two foot resolution, meaning every pixel in the picture is no more than two feet big. And there's absolutely no evidence of anything remotely like what Lowell suggested. That is evidence. That's what evidence means. So we know Lowell is wrong, not because we don't believe him. We know Lowell is wrong because we saw that he was wrong. That is the essence of the scientific method. That's the essence of what we do in science. The opinion doesn't matter. Now, you've read the Bologna Detection Kit as well. That was part of the module. In there, you should have read about arguments from authority. This is what we're talking about here. The only authority that we accept in science is nature. We don't accept the authority of some person who comes up and says, this is true because I say it's true. Now, if they're well-trained and they have a track record of success and, and uh, seeing things correctly, then we pay attention. But they don't determine what we believe. They don't determine what we think. What determines what we think, if we're acting scientifically, is nature herself, the evidence directly from nature herself. And so this is just a simple, simple example, but it's an important one. Because it basically states what this is at the center of all of science. And here is another gentleman, this guy is named Richard Feynman. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 1965 for absolutely brilliant work in, in uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics. And this is a statement of the concept that I'm talking about. So you don't have to take it from me. You can listen to other scientists. This is the way scientists tend to think. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. So that's our view. That's how we, we see things. So keep that in mind for the rest of the semester. Keep that in mind for the rest of your life. And that's something that we don't do naturally necessarily. In fact, if you, if you spend time looking at popular culture, spend time looking at the media, spend time looking at politics, spend time looking at law, people don't always argue from evidence. They often don't argue from evidence. But in science, we try to make sure that that's what our focus is. Why? Because so far, it's been in, insanely successful. Making nature our only authority has allowed us to increase, literally double, the lifespan of Americans and other people around the world in less than 100 years. We use the exact same sort of thought processes to send spacecraft into Mars or to, uh, or to other places. Today, as I'm recording this, one of the most interesting things that happened in recent history was using exactly this thought process. And it was the first time in nine years that Americans have launched into space from American soil. So that's why it's so important to us. And that's why we're going to cling to that very, very carefully as we go through this course.